Welcome everyone and thank you for attending the Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics webinar on physician and mid-level provider billing for lactation services. Uh, my name is Dr. Shelley Shallon. I'm a pediatrician in Peoria, Illinois, and I'm director of our newborn nursery at OSF St. Francis Medical Center. Um, additionally, I serve on the ICAPS breastfeeding committee. We are also have an active local collaborative, the Central Illinois Breastfeeding Professional Network. As you probably all know, much work is underway across the state in both our inpatient and outpatient settings to advocate for lactation and really support the infrastructure necessary for our families to be successful in their journeys. Uh, and I think I speak for all of us as professionals that we recognize the importance of human milk for human babies. And I think we all understand that payment for lactation services is definitely not currently straightforward. We are very grateful for Dr. Shaw's presentation today to help shine some light on our current options. Malika Shaw is the medical director of the uh, Prentice Newborn Nursery at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and an associate professor, professor Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and an attending neo neonatologist at the NICUs of Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and Prentice Women's Hospital. She completed her pre-medical studies at Stanford University, her medical education and pediatrics residency at Baylor College of Medicine, and a neonatology fellowship at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She is a strong advocate of breastfeeding friendly practices, and she's spoken to numerous media outlets, including WGTV, The Atlantic, and the Chicago Tribune. Her testimony before the State Senate on the importance of lactation spaces in Chicagoland airports was instrumental in the passing of the bill. So she's really excited to talk to you today about strategies for billing and for the hard work you do. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much for that a really wonderful um, introduction. I just wanted to make sure, can everybody hear me? Can uh, just, Shelly, can you hear me if I get over? Yes, yep. I can. Okay, yep. so, all right. Um, so I'm gonna be talking to you about physician and mid-level provider billing. Um, and I, this is a topic near and dear to my heart because I do think it's so very important um, that people understand how to bill for the very careful and conscientious care that they give. Um, uh, there we go. Um, as many of us know, the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2012. Um, and there were two major provisions that affect breastfeeding. One was coverage of comprehensive lactation support and counseling. And the other was the cost of renting and purchasing breastfeeding equipment for the duration of breastfeeding. These benefits are typically linked to maternal benefits. And if pediatric providers use these, the claim often needs to be submitted under the mother's name. There are some issues about this though, actually some very, very serious challenges. And here we are like almost a decade later and you know things are still actually really not great. I hate talking about this, but the sad reality is, is that the ACA legislates coverage, but its lack of specificity really, really impedes its, the ability for it to be effective. So it really doesn't say who should be paid. Like, is it pediatrician? Is it obstetrician? Is it the um, hospital that the baby's born at? Is it antenatal counseling? And how much um, the reimbursement should be? Um, it doesn't specify whether charges can be made separate from other visits. And insurance really still has a lot of control. So the reality is, is that a lot of this presentation is really based on um, different sort of coding toolkits, which are largely based on sort of like what people have tried and what works. And I mean, that's not really the, the ideal sort of model, but um, it does seem to be what I think, I mean, it's what's needed is for people to know what other people do and what might actually work in getting some amount of reimbursement. Um, these are three um, sources that I use to put together this presentation. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, has a web page and on that web page there are coding toolkits. So there's coding for telemedicine services, um, which has been updated pretty frequently since COVID. And there is supporting breastfeeding and lactation, the primary care pediatrician's guide to coding, 
um, which was just most recently updated last year. And finally, there is a women's preventative services initiative um, that puts out a coding guide that is specific to breastfeeding services and supplies. So I, at the end of the presentation, I do have the links to all of these, um, all of these toolkits. Um, the outline of like what I'm going to be talking about with billing, um, because I do think this is primarily pediatricians, is um, newborn follow-up visit, um, extra time spent at office visits, use of time-based coding, um, consultations, care provided for the mother, care by allied health professional services, telehealth, and commonly reported ICD-10 codes. And then I'm going to get to just a summary of like what providers have said actually works. So physician and mid-level providers can do the following. They can use current CPD or ICD-10 um, codes. Um, they can code based on time if greater than 50% of the time is spent in counseling or coordination of care. Um, they can use the um, modifier 25 to office co visit codes to report extended time spent on feeding problems at a preventative medicine service visit. The AAP website actually has a whole section on using modifier 25. Um, I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir for any pediatricians here because it's just a really commonly used code for a lot of things, um, but it can be used for lactation services as well. Um, and to provide lactation counseling via telemedicine, um, CPT codes for that can also be used. Um, so to begin with the hospital follow-up visit, it's typically a new patient visit um, and um, it, CPT code 99391, which is a preventative health visit code can be used. Um, there, the code um, ICD-10 CM Z00.111, which is a health examination for a newborn age zero to 28 days can also be used. If you have, if you use extra time at this visit, you can append with the modifier 25. And if you schedule a follow-up visit, you can use the 99211 to 99215 codes, which are so commonly used for so many things. Um, just note 99211 is a nurse only visit and a very short visit that doesn't get much reimbursement, which I'll get to in the back. So that would be like, for instance, if you were just doing a weight check with a nurse only visit. You can bill based on time when more than 50% of the practitioner's face-to-face -face time has been spent on counseling or coordination of care. You can use time as the key factor for most of the routine codes, 99212 to 99215, when counseling, education, or coordination of care dominate a visit. You do have to document on the chart the total face-to-face -face time with the patient and or the patient's family and a description of what was discussed. These are the um, CPT guidelines for billing based on time and how much time is spent, you know, ranging from a new patient is always more um, and an established patient um, has the codes over here and then outpatient consultation. Consultations come in three parts. You have to request the consultation from another physician or it could be an LC. Then there's render when the service is actually delivered and then report back to the person who referred. And so the billing for those codes, which were in the previous slide um, on the right, um, can be based either on key components or timed. And then the follow-up visits are you're right back to those 99212 to 99215 codes. Billing for both mother and baby. This is probably something that is underutilized. Um, if the physician or other billable licensed healthcare provider is taking the mother's history, examining her breasts and nipples, observing a feeding and making a diagnosis and treatment, the clinician is treating a second patient. This may change the visit with the infant into two separate and identifiable visits with two different patients, two two patients, two visits, two records, two bills, and we can't forget that it could be two co-pays as well. So it is, I mean, it does have implications for the patients, but the mother is likely a new patient for the team, so the new patient codes would need to be used. And you can, you have to be accurate about the time. There's no double dipping. So if you spent, say, 20, 30 minutes on that visit, it can't be 30 for each of them. Then you can actually split that time, 15 for the baby and 15 for the new patient, the mother, or something like that. Um, the, 
These are screenshots from the Women's Preventative Services Initiative um, from the 2021 coding guide. Um, just a little bit more about billing for the mom. So for non-Medicare payers, routine lactation consult counseling is considered part of the global obstetrics package for postpartum services and is therefore not reported separately. You can only really code for complications, illness, or disease um, when it's billed in addition to the global services. Um, so that's just something that is really unfortunate. And like the ACA says you have to provide lactation services, but it doesn't say that you have to be supported extra for that. So, I mean, it is kind of a complication of the billing system. Um, there are different payers do, however, do have varying policies on whether they will reimburse for the service during the postpartum period. So it's advisable to check with individual payers for their specific policies and to obtain those instructions in writing. Um, if approved by the payer, the following procedure codes are the ones that um, the Women's Preventative Services Initiative recommends. Um, and then these would be in combination with the ICD, the ICD-10 code Z39.1, which is Encounter for Care and Examination of Lactating Mother. And so these are preventative health codes and they go in, they range in time from 15 minutes to 60 minutes. Um, Antepartum counseling, this is really interesting, um, depending on specific payer global obstetrics reimbursement policies, on the other hand, may be reported. If the counseling is reportable outside the global obstetrics package, you can consider billing these visits as follows. So if the patient sees the physician and the lactation counselor, um, report a single evaluation and management code. The code level selected would be based on the combined level of service by the two providers and supported by ac adequate documentation. Um, if the patient sees the lactation counselor only, um, who is a non-licensed, who is a licensed, sorry, licensed non-physician practitioner, um, it may be appropriate to um, report the 99211 codes. Um, the only thing is the 99211 codes don't reimburse at very high rates. Um, and there's also the CPT code 98960, um, which is often used actually for OTs and things like that. Um, but again, it can be used by qualified non-physician healthcare professional using a standardized curriculum who's face-to-face -face with the patient. Um, so these are the, the codes that um, the Women's Preventative Services Initiative recommends um, for using. Antepartum counseling, it's really interesting from, as a neonatologist, something, it's something that we do a lot of, and it's something that we're very particular about billing um, for. So if we do an antenatal consult for mom in preterm labor, um, even when it's outpatient, we do bill for that. Um, it's something that I don't know, you know, I think a lot of pediatricians don't utilize that because they are actually trying to gain a patient. And so a lot of them will do, you know, free sort of pediatrician visits. Um, but if you're giving specific lactation advice that it might be something, or if someone's in sort of an incorporated healthcare system already, that might be something, um, that could be utilized more frequently. Um, for group visits, um, the following codes would be appropriate, um, and these are the 98961 and 98962, um, and these, this would be, the first one is for two to four patients, and the other one is for five to eight patients. Medicaid does not cover these, so CMS does not, does not cover these codes, um, but there are certain um, insurances that do. Um, and finally, for um, the last thing for moms is existing breastfeeding problems. So if a patient presents with a breastfeeding problem that the physician must evaluate and manage, um, then you can, again, report the 99212 to 99215 um, codes um, or um, the 99202 or 99205 if the mom's a new patient. This would include taking the history, examining breasts and nipples, observing a breastfeeding, and making a diagnosis and treatment plan for the woman. Um, finally, the follow-up services provided by non-clinical provider. We talked a little bit about these, but um, if to report these services, um, 
the initial problem has to be diagnosed by a physician, but then you can use these codes um, for, um, for non-clinical providers or non-physician providers. And um, they're all listed over here for you and kind of range from um, 15 to 30 minutes. And then the group ones are on here too. So just the last word about allied health professionals, it, it, the intervention, the health behavior and assessment codes can be used, but they do require that the medical condition has been previously diagnosed by a physician or other health qualified healthcare professional, such as an APN. Um, they can't be used on the same day as any, um, as any other um, service by the same provider. And they are not for um, risk factor reduction. So there's a lot of restrictions about these, but if they're covered by the insurer, the codes are a good way to pay for your office lactation consultant who is not otherwise licensed or credentialed for billing. Um, telemedicine has really, really made um, a huge impact in sort of these COVID times. Um, and, there, and the um, AAP has a coding fact sheet. Um, it, when I gave this presentation last um, year, there was a lot of different codes, which I'll go into too, but now um, you can use modifier 9.5 with existing codes that you use. So telemedicine is defined as a real-time interactive audio and video telecommunication system. It does need to be HIPAA compliant. You can't use TikTok or FaceTime or any of those sort of modalities. You have to have a secure platform um, for that. Um, but the examples of using the codes that you always use are right here. So for an office or other subsequent um, outpatient visit, you can use 99201 to 99215, which are for new patients, um, and they're allowed. Um, subsequent hospital care services, you can use 99231, 99233. Um, office consultation and inpatient consultation, though, um, are um, they have ICD. 10 codes, but CMS does not allow them. And telephone services um, are also something, you know, not everybody is going to have sort of an iPad or something like that to get on to telehealth. So telephone services can also be reimbursed. This is from the AAP toolkit. Um, and um, it has to be with an established patient or an established patient's parent or guardian, the telephone or online service cannot originate from a related um, service or procedure for the patient within the previous seven days. Um, so I think they're just expecting that those are just part of that care that you provided in person. Um, and they cannot be used if the call leads to a face-to-face -face service or procedure within the next 24 hours. Um, or if you don't have you know, a, an appointment in 24 hours and you make it in 48 hours, um, this, the soonest available appointment. So if someone calls, has an illness, has a question, and the recommendation is basically to come in, you can't bill for both of those. Um, but 99441 and 99443 are for services provided by a physician. And then those 98966 to 98968 codes are for a qualified healthcare professional. Um, other telehealth codes, I think we've kind of gone over these a little bit, um, and but these these are from the AAP toolkit. So like we talked about the HIPAA compliant secure platforms, which allow digital communication with the physician or qualified healthcare professional, they do have to be HIPAA compliant. They can't be like FaceTime or something like that. Um, again, cannot originate from a related service in the previous seven days. Um, and these are the codes that can be used. Um, Joint billing codes, I mean, there are definitely times when a nurse practitioner um, or a physician um, join the lactation consultant partway through the encounter. Um, and if the physician, this is actually a really um, good way to bill for these visits, then the physician will review the history, examine the infant document in the chart, the physician's the physical findings, diagnoses, and plans, and then you can use those same um, established or new patient visit codes. Um, interdisciplinary team conferences, um, physicians um, will continue to use those codes um, using time as the controlling factor based on face-to-face -face time spent on counseling and coordination of care. Um, 
And to bill for participation by non-physician qualified healthcare professionals, you can use 99366 for meetings of 30 minutes or more. Um, and for those codes, there has to be a minimum of three qualified healthcare professionals in attendance. Um, these are some commonly reported um, codes for neonates. Um, and I just will like talk to you just about a couple of them. So um, if you do have a visit for ankyloglossia, that, that can count as one. Um, you can also have um, like change in bowel habits, um, fussy infant, um, excessive crying, failure to thrive, abnormal weight gain or weight loss underweight, dehydration, all of these are, are, um, are good ICD-10 codes to use for follow-up visits. And then for the moms, um, if you choose to put her in as a new patient, you can actually, there's some sleep-related ones. Um, there's things for cracked nipples, for candidiasis, um, and just some general codes for lactation. And there's that encounter for care and examination of lactating mother is Z39.1. So this is the really sad part, and I hate to like be such a downer, but you know what actually works. Um, this is um, actually available to everyone, and if you click on this link, um, it's it was most recently updated in July of 2021, and they will actually tell you what the reimbursement levels are for these. So, I mean, these are different. They're very similar to last year's slides, but I did update them from just what had been reported for July 2021, and um, it you know, a new patient um, preventative healthcare visit is, is um, the Medicaid reimbursement is like $31. Um, a nurse visit for a weight check or something similar would be like $12. Um, our established patient visits, the codes that are most commonly used, the 99212 to 99215 um, are, you know, 20, 23 to $67. And then the consultation visits are, I mean, just barely more. So that's kind of unfortunately the sad part. Um, I don't have anything more. Um, I do want to end just by saying um, I am actually stepping down from the chair role for the ICAP um, committee. I've been doing this for a number of years now and um, have become a little overcommitted at work. Um, but I really hope um, this is a presentation that was put together probably about two years ago now. Um, and it's a, um, it's a continuing um, medical education um, three-part CME series on breastfeeding as a health prevention strategy, breastfeeding the term, the healthy term infant and special considerations in breastfeeding. And so I really encourage everybody to kind of um, sort of continue to examine the critical role that physicians play and, and nurse practitioners um, and, and breastfeeding promotion and support. It's free. Um, you can create a free account. And um, this was something that I made a few years ago um, with the whole breastfeeding committee. Um, and um, we, if you know of anyone that is joining the um, interest in joining the ICAP committee on breastfeeding, um, please help have them contact Sarah. Um, her um, and email information is up there. It would be absolutely wonderful to have more um, members. Um, and I do also want to thank um, some folks from Swedish Covenant and Erie Family Health Center um, and Northwestern who just kind of helped um, a lot with this presentation. As most of you who know me know, I am an inpatient um, primarily an inpatient physician in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I do follow up um, in a in a, a developmental follow-up clinic, but I don't actually bill for lactation myself. So pulling this together really was a effort, a team effort from a lot of other folks um, that I know that kind of helped me with this. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them. Um, and with that, I will take some questions if anybody has any. Malika, thank you. This was really helpful and interesting and a really nice summary of, of uh, what's out there and available. Um, 
as I was listening, I, I couldn't help but, oh, someone else has asked mine, but the interesting part is how difficult it is to get, you know, the reimbursement for your lactation specialists. Yeah. You know, most of this is really tied in with physician and P provider and the incredible value that they have and the incredible amount of time they take. So mm-hmm. kind of from what I saw today from you, the combined visit with them mm-hmm. seemed like the most um, practical solution for a pediatric office to you know, engage the provider, diagnose with the provider, and then allow the lactation specialist to team with you to really do their um, job. Would you agree that that was? Definitely. Um, and yeah, and speaking to Gwynne and Wilbur at Swedish Covenant, like they run a lactation clinic and they do always make sure that there is an APN um, and a or and or a physician there so that they can provide supervision for those visits and bill for them. You know, so it's, it is unfortunate. Um, I, I, I think there have been some changes with like, I know Aetna covers some, um, some lactation consultant visits, but it's so hit or miss and physicians are so physician practices are so overworked and strapped. You cannot possibly know what every insurance will cover. You know, you bill it and you find out later that it isn't reimbursed. I mean, it is almost more efficient to start with what you know will be reimbursed. Um, I do want to say that like in my division um, and in my department, there are, I think now three physicians um, who um, have completed their IB LCE training. And I think that that is fantastic. Like it's really wonderful if a nurse practitioner or physician can have that designation because then they can bill in either role, but have the expertise of both, you know, I mean, that sounds like such a crazy ask, but unfortunately in so many years, this has really not changed. We do have a few uh, questions in the chat. Um, okay. I don't know how to Nick see. Reynolds, I can read those if you'd like, since you have your, sure. you know, Nick Reynolds is asking, what would you say is the cutoff age for neonatal diagnoses? Probably oh, for, for billing purposes, I think he's saying. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, typically like 30 days, I think. Yeah, the good news, a lot of those diagnoses that you showed were more vague and I'm sure could mm-hmm. be used throughout that entire first year or two of life. Right, um, yeah. Um, um, Heather Ludwig, I've heard of several hospitals billing for inpatient and outpatient services using IBCLCs. Do you know much about that? Yeah, so the inpatient part is not, it's almost always going to be bundled. Um, if the baby's in the NICU, um, it'll be part of the bundled NICU charge. And if it's in the postpartum, it says the bundled postpartum. Um, that is partly, I think, why so often some hospitals are, you know, work hard to sort of double dip on those positions, like either have people who are um, IVLCE certified be a physician also, or be a nurse practitioner also, they don't fund those positions um, independently. What's really sad is a lot of times those positions are actually funded by formula companies. I mean, I don't think it's something that's talked about enough, um, but the position for the lactation consultant is oftentimes funded by like a Mead Johnson or an Abbott or something like that. Um, It is not fully reimbursed it doesn't, they don't cover their own costs of their own salary by independent billing because it just comes into the bundled um, fee for whatever is charged for say a routine vaginal delivery or a routine C-section. There's not an extra reimbursement on the part of the insurance company for the LC seeing the patient. Um, I don't know and how- then um, Sorry, go ahead. Um, that also the follow up to that was the outpatient services bill. So the outpatient the services also. as well are it it the only I mean I know that it's very hard to get like an like a lactation um, clinic up and running that is just LCs. 
So that's again where that APN um, or physician coming in can really make a big, big difference. Um, I do like want to say one thing though, like because I, um, I LCs are really, really, really important, but in the hospital, um, my experience has been that sometimes it's counterproductive to have them be the only sort of the only way that someone can breastfeed. I mean, I've seen it over and over again that like, you know, a baby who's got transient tachypnea of the newborn or something and is better, you know, and you'll hear like a resident or someone just sort of be like, oh yeah, no, you should definitely breastfeed. I'm going to like tell the LC to come see you. And it's like, no, 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 no. No, you are going to take that baby who's better and you are going to put that baby in the mom's arms and that baby's going to breastfeed right now. And so there, there is the inpatient side, I, I think really it is everybody's responsibility. And I'm really lucky to work at Northwestern where the nurses and the NICU were really fantastic about, you know, getting these babies on breast and whatnot. But there are, there was a time like, you know, many years ago when that was really common, you know, when it's like, oh yeah, you know, if you want to eat, like, let's call a speech therapist. It's like, no, 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 no. This is something that 95% of the time with our term babies will be normal and you just need to capture it in the moment. So it, we do get into this whole like thing where like, we're not billing for the LCs, we're not billing for the LCs, but it, there's a reason that formula companies push so hard to have LCs because sometimes in certain situations, you know, it makes the other providers be like, okay, that's off my plate. I don't have to worry about breastfeeding. I can just call the LC. Um, I don't, I've worked at different hospitals, you know, and I like Swedish Covenant has a lot of LCs and has an amazing model where it's all very integrated. Um, but there are, and I, I encourage other people to chime in about what the model that works for them, but it, it can, you know, most of the world doesn't have LCs in regular maternal hospital. It's, you know, it's just the responsibility of the nurse and the mom and the OB and everybody to get that baby on breast. Um, so anyway, but I, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think that's the baby friendly certification and different, exactly. like everyone needs to have the uh, education. So everyone that kind of touches that family is on the same page. Right. So that was, that was great. And the out and services, I'll just chime in. I'm not um, sure, but I, I do know some of the independent um, lactation consultants that um, see patients independently. Um, they do have some reimbursement options. One I know is with a group and they directly, I think, negotiate with insurers. Um, mm -hmm. But that goes along to Dr. Shaw's point about how spotty that all is. So, and not straightforward and not consistent. And I don't mm -hmm. think Medicaid specifically. So, um, right. okay. Um, question, Heather, uh, let's see. Um, this is Amy uh, mm -hmm. shirt. Scherninger, in your experience, would a lactation consultant getting a referral listing diagnosis codes from the provider increase the opportunity for reimbursement? So again, that just completely depends on the insurance, but yes, it certainly might. Um, just been feeling like Aetna is a lot more flexible than they used to be. You know, this is just all anecdotal though, you know. Um, I think Blue Cross Blue Shield is pretty good, but it does vary. You know, it varies on what plan they have and um, and what insurance they have. Um, but it and and that's the problem with the ACA is that it says that lactation is supposed to be covered, but it doesn't say by whom. So it it I mean, is that that does that just mean physicians and APNs are supposed to do it, or is it supposed to specifically cover an LC? Um, so it, 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 would, it definitely helps if something is medically indicated um, and, and whether it's covered by insurance, I do think private insurance is definitely doing, doing better. So I, my answer to that question would be yes. Well, thank you. It seems, seems like um, we have good options and we have a lot of, uh, work to still do. <laughs> yeah, well, that's for certain. Um, anything else? Uh, 
that's all I see in the chat as far as questions go. Okay, well, thank you all so much for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you for this information. Thank you.